We're here today. I'm going to share a little bit about what we've been doing at the museum. Steve's going to talk with us, and then we're all going to talk. But I wanted to just open up with the image that we see behind me. Um, it's just a really nice way to start the day. And what we're looking at is simply one of the many reflected rainbows that line the stairways of the museum. And as we guide young people into our museum, we count them. And that's their first experience with us. And it's, um, it's really nice to be able to start our days with young people from a magical space. And I thought it was fitting for this morning. So that'll, that'll set us off. Great. Thank you, Jen. And uh, I just also want to extend uh, my thank you to Emma and Olivia. And uh, I want to thank Barbara Pally, who uh, played a role early on in making this happen. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm uh, perhaps the only uh, person here who, or one of the few who is not a museum education professional. Um, I'm impressed by the growth of NICMER and was trying, I'm not very good at math, but um, at that rate, I think in 15 more years, you'll be having your annual meeting in Madison Square Garden. Um, it's pretty exponential. Uh, I'm, I'm especially pleased to uh, be here uh, to talk about the Sugar Hill Museum, but also because of the, the theme of this conference today of intersections. So I will say a little bit more about my own background in a few minutes, um, but I want to I start by talking about intersections and some thoughts that uh, coming here today have, uh, has provoked for me. Um, let me just say at the outset, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some thoughts uh, that will give you a little bit of um, background on the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. Jen then will share um, quite a few images and a, a sense of daily life in the museum. And then we'll, we'll, together we'll step back and uh, ask ourselves some remaining questions about intersections. Um, and, uh, and hopefully there'll be time for some Q&A, but we're not, we're not sure. Sound OK? Yeah. Good. Um, so it's interesting. The intersections uh, is an interesting theme. And I realized that I use that term often to describe what I do. I often say to myself and to others that um, I have the, the privilege uh, to work at the intersection of art and learning. And that that's an amazing space to be in. And um, I feel grateful for that every day. As I began to think about what sort of is in my mind when I uh, picture that intersection, I've, I've always wanted to have uh, the PowerPoint capacity to um, create a uh, street sign that had art and learning on it. Um, but then I was playing out in my mind, what, what is that image? It's, the, it's a fairly, uh, if you will, a fairly concrete image. It's, it's streets that intersect at a right angle. And um, sometimes, and what that sort of suggests is that you enter the intersection either from the avenue of the arts or Education Street, and, um, and that when you get to the intersection, you either continue on the path you've been on, or you have to take a right or a left down this other road. And it's an, it's an, my whole image for a long time has been that that's an exciting intersection. All kinds of amazing things happening on every corner, lots of stuff in the middle, kind of a, uh, not a lot of car traffic, more like a, a street party. Um, but, but the actual, the metaphor doesn't really actually work for me because the idea that you are one thing and then you decide whether to stay that thing or on that path or go on to another path isn't actually the way that I, it's not the lived reality of that intersection of art and learning. So I was trying to figure out 
what is more like the lived reality than that kind of what I started to think of as um, very solid uh, based image. And what I began to think of was liquids, and in particular rivers, because when rivers intersect, the, it all becomes one swirling thing, so inseparable and indecipherable. And that's actually what the intersection of art and learning has become for me over the years. Um, so I used to think that I had to choose between art and education and um, have come to think of that as a kind of illusion that's been promulgated. And I'm not sure who put it out there. But if, when I find them, <laughs> I'm going to yell at them because they've messed up my life, and they've messed up the lives of many other people by creating this sense that these are somehow separate activities, and that in some, on some days, in some settings, uh, one has higher status over the other. But both of them, in the end, are fairly marginalized in the society, which means that you start to develop a kind of double, doubly marginalized identity in that space. All of that is deeply problematic. If I was prone to conspiracy theories, which I am, <laughs> I'd say there's a conspiracy afoot. But I won't go down that, further down that path. Suffice to say that rivers are probably a more useful image about the intersection of art and learning um, than streets, and probably more useful when we think about many of the other uh, intersections that we're going to talk about today in, as we talk about the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Learning. Can, uh, oh, and there we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so this is, a, this is just a quick graphic that um, Jen and I uh, thought would be useful as a starting point, but it, it by no means captures all of the intersections that are at work in the Sugar Hill Children's Museum. But you can see children, community, community, storytelling, storytelling art, art and children. I mean, the real question is why in the world would we ever, would it be unusual to think about these things being at an intersection, these things being combined. Um, why would the idea of a children's museum of art and storytelling not be commonplace in this society? Why is it such an unusual event? So I've come to think about the last um, 45 years or so of my life as a kind of reclamation project. Um, I didn't always have this notion, it's pretty recent, but when I look back over what I've been doing, um, the, the reclamation has been to bring things that have been pulled apart back together. And, um, and that can be, because, they, because they're natural together, each of these elements um, should be together in a very natural and um, integrated way. So as part of childhood, as part of the development of language and literacy, as part of formal and informal education, as part of community, as part of daily life, and as part of a decent and moral and equitable democracy. So the reclamation can be a challenge in this society, but there are many people who do actually do really beautiful work in this way, trying to bring these elements together in their natural form. Um, and that's very inspiring, but there's never enough of it. So about nine years ago, I got a phone call uh, at work from uh, Ellen Baxter, and Ellen is here. Uh, Ellen is the founder and, 
I, Ellen, I don't know your title, Executive Director of Broadway Housing Communities, something like that. Um, Ellen's been there from the start, and she, uh, I had never heard of Broadway Housing Communities. Another um, problem, really, because I've been working at the intersection of art and learning, but not f very deeply aware or connected to, for example, um, housing and public health issues. I'm aware of them, I think about them, I have some colleagues in those areas, but why isn't that part of my everyday reality? So I was delighted to hear Ellen's voice and to have her begin to describe to me something that was completely out of the realm that I had ever um, encountered before. And that was this dream that uh, she and her colleagues at Broadway Housing Communities had to create a new, a new building um, with uh, a large number of apartments for people who had been living um, in unstable housing situations. And also in that building, at the same time, early childhood center, preschool, and also in that building at the same time, a children's museum? Never, nothing had prepared me for that combination. But it felt, even as she was explaining the history of how that came to be, it felt so intuitively right that I was saying yes before she'd even asked me to do anything. She asked me if I would come down uh, or if I was going to be in New York and I would come over and uh, join them in a conversation. That was about nine years ago, and I'm happily uh, remained in that conversation since then. I did that. Why I said yes so quickly? I have a background in theater, not museums, not visual art, although theater is a visual art. I have um, a background in teaching in high schools, not with young children. I had worked at that point for about 10 years in a collaboration a research project with preschool educators from Reggio Emilia, Italy. Um, so I was very, I was becoming much more tuned to early childhood. Um, and I had recently, at that point, become the director of the Arts in Education program at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, a, a role that I continue to hold today, and a, and a position that has allowed me to think across art forms, across in-school and out-of-school, working with museum educators, performing arts folks, um, people who work in community settings. That's the beauty of the arts and education program for me, was it is a totally different kind of conversation than I'd ever been in in my 20 years, nearly 20 years of teaching in high schools, teaching theater in high schools. Um, but also, I mean, I'd been trying for my entire adult life and really from uh, much earlier, my entire, m m from the beginning of my moral consciousness, growing up in the 1950s in Baltimore, Maryland, I'd been trying to figure out um, how to live and for much of that time trying to figure out how to live was there a way to live as an artist in a society that was racist, sexist, homophobic, and fundamentally brutal? In a society that was controlled by and for the benefit of white men, which are two descriptors of me. So it's, it's been not obvious to me. I wish that it has been, it would have been more obvious. But when I heard Ellen describe the dream of the Children's Museum, it was instantly clear to me that there was a vision here of a kind of society that 
was the kind of society I would prefer to live in, and I wanted to do whatever I could to be part of that. I w so I came down to New York. Uh, I began to be part of a conversation that has continued. I want to just quickly acknowledge some of the people here today who've been part of that conversation, some from the beginning, like Ellen, um, Ophelia Rodriguez, I think is here, uh, Charlene Melville, um, but also some newer colleagues who work with the museum, Tony Gonzalez and Joyce Lawler, uh, Sherry Sandler, I believe is here, and Sandra Garcia Betancourt, I know is here. Um, all of these are folks who have worked with Broadway housing communities or who uh, work with the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. So I wanna share um, a little bit of text from one of the conversations that uh, I was part of. And this one took place on December 12th, 2008. And it was a conversation that uh, there were about, I don't know, 15 or so people there, but the two people who were uh, central to the conversation were David Ajay, who you see there. David is the architect of the, of the Sugar Hill building. And you can see that's the building that is in these images. Um, and Faith Ringgold. And I'm, uh, Faith is artist, uh, writer, illustrator, um, who, and educator. I'm guessing that many of you are familiar with Faith's work, are you? Um, so I want to share a couple of things. So we had a, we had a day together. It, I think it was the only time that we had re a real length of time for David and Faith to really talk about what their vision was. So this is 2008. That's um, eight years ago. Uh, early, much earlier in the process, the building was, was far from constructed at that point. I, I was facilitating this conversation and um, and here are a couple of things that uh, people said. I asked David what was attractive to him in the first place about this idea of a um, children's museum of art and storytelling. What did it conjure up for him? And he said, well, what it didn't do was conjure up images, but it spoke about relationships. We searched, and I don't think there is a museum of storytelling. As ubiquitous as storytelling is to civilization, you would think there would be lots of museums. In my own work, I seek to emerge things that are invisible and make them visible. There are children's museums that have storytelling as part of their education agenda, but I felt there was something that could be learned and given as a kind of typology, setting the groundwork for a new way of thinking about something, because this speaks about a part of the community. Because when children's museums are made, it's often made in a tokenistic way, and it serves a certain kind of purpose that doesn't really reflect an art experience directly. And one of the things that I love about what this project proposes is, one, it is not a grand palazzo civic project. It's buried in the heart of a community. It's about the community. It's laminated within the life of the community, so the idea of life and art are being blurred because they're in a single experience. And I think the challenges are going to be about allowing that. The idea that somehow a child's life has, right, has art right from the beginning as part of their experience and there's even a formal curated experience that is part of their world. It's in the building. So if you, when you listen to that, he's talking really about intersections there that are intersections that um, are not so common and that bother him and he wants to see. Faith, um, if you know Faith, you know that um, she, as much as she loves her visual images, she really loves words. And she loves storytelling, and she loves to tell stories. She told stories 
all morning about storytelling. <laughs> or really story listening, because uh, most of the stories were about being a child growing up in Sugar Hill in Harlem and listening to the stories um, being told in her family, but in her, particularly in her apartment, as many, many people pass through uh, their apartment on their way from one place to another, often from the south to New York or beyond to other northern cities. Um, but early on in her uh, teenage life, Faith began to um, actually work with younger people as, um, as a teacher. And it was one of the great things to learn about Faith that day was that she uh, was a teacher before she was formally a teacher. She was a teacher and an artist, and she's remained a teacher and an artist her entire life. They are, for her and in her, inseparable as visual images and words are inseparable in so much of her work. She's, she was talking about children, and she said children love art. They love to look at it, they love to be around it, and they love even more to make it. And they love each other's art. They want to see themselves in the art. They want children that look like them in it. They want to see themselves and their life. She went on um, to state something that's probably obvious to many of you, but uh, was not so obvious to me. And she's talking about young children here. And I want you to uh, sort of stay tuned to the word composition, because it, it begins to play, I think, a really important role in this story. She said, the art gives them that outlet. They're being highly creative, but really, they're reforming their life. In their attempt to create certain images, those images are all part of their life. But the way they put the shapes and forms together shows their acute ability for the use of color and composition. And it's amazing because ordinary adults can't do that. Now, they're not able to really skillfully draft a horse or a man or a car, but they can put these things together in a composition which is one of the most important things about being an artist, is to put things together in a way that's pleasing to the eye. They don't have a problem with that. They just start. And color and composition, that's what they're masterful at. And composition, I just keep composition as a, uh, the multiple meanings of what it is to compose as both part of an artist's work, but also part of um, the work of being human beings. Um, keep that in mind through all of this and through uh, the rest of today. Then she talked explicitly about children as storytellers. But I want, she says, but I want to say this. The greatest storytellers are really little children. They really can mix it up. <laughs> mix the real with the unreal. And they just go ahead with it. I remember in a class of kindergarten kids, I taught little children also, and I was looking at this boy's work, and each child, no matter what's on the page that you see, there's a story that goes along with that, and you don't know until you ask that child. And then they're going to come and tell you. So this little boy told me this whole long story about his work, and I listened to him, and he said, and this is for you. They're very generous. And this little girl sitting next to him says, well, maybe you want to tell, uh, no, there was, and this little girl was sitting next to him. I said, well, maybe you want to tell me the story about your work. And she said, this is for you too. Finally, um, she's been talking a lot during this conversation about what's um, natural and relatively uh, done with ease by children and harder for adults. And here she's talking about just going to museums. I think that adults, when they go to a museum, do feel like I don't know what this is and I don't want to say anything because I don't know if it's the right thing. I don't know if I'm looking at the right thing. You know, I'm terrified. 
I'm not only afraid, I'm terrified. <laughs> However, children don't have that. It doesn't matter how spectacular the art is, they just accept it because they're artists too. And that is the most wonderful way of explaining why there needs to be a children's museum because this is not just some children somewhere, this is all children everywhere. This, they take to this marking thing, this color, this composition. You don't even have to have words for them. You don't have to do anything, just give them the materials, the time, the space, the place to do it in, and they will make some too. They are excellent at both things. They are great little storytellers, and they are great artists as well. So I think that's a perfect segue into <laughs> what I think Jen is about to share. You know, the easiest part of the work is, is letting the kids just do, you know, and it's our job to, to watch and see what we can get and how we can be better because of what they're teaching us. Um, so this is our building, <laughs> and that it's all encompassing. We have our um, housing. Our preschool is over here that Steve was talking about. That's the entrance. The entrance to the housing is right here. We've got 146 units in this space. And over here is our entrance to the museum itself. This is the interior of one of the buildings. I just wanted to show how bright and beautiful they are. This is the interior of our preschool. Again, we live in a world of light, which is amazing, and the museum happens to be in the basement of this building, and that's what I wanted to start with the, with the rainbow, because we've somehow, David has somehow given us this beautiful prism of light to work in, which is really nice. Um, and again, here we just see the entrances to the spaces and our patio, where you can come play with us in the summer. There we go. So we're talking about giving, we are rooted in a community, and we have these variant peoples that are coming in. And you know, when we talk about serving a public, or we talk about serving a population, or we're here to do work, and we assume that we know what people want, we are wrong, right? So we're kind of trying to figure out how do we invite people to tell us what they want and tell us how to do our job for them in a way that's anonymous, that's free, that's fun. And so this is our wishing tree. And on the first day that we opened, we asked everybody that joined us to write down a wish that they had for themselves, for their community, or for the museum. And I wanted to share some of these with you. So we see it on the left. And then I wish all the kids in the mu see the museum by Ava. <laughs> and then down here, I wish everybody was happy. And um, when I saw that at the end of the day, I'm going through all of these wishes, you know, and I saw that one and it really made me stop because I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, me too. And um, <laughs> that's kind of the reason that the museum was built, right? It's to create a space where people can live and appreciate their lives. And so we, we all wish people were happy. So there's that. Um, and then we wish the museum will stay here forever. And um, I wish for painting classes. <laughs> and I ended with this one in this, in this little chapter here because we weren't planning initially on providing technical classes. We're thinking we want to create a space where we have free exploration, kids can come and they can just engage with materials and make whatever they want and tell their stories to us. But we heard this and now on Sundays at 3.30, you can come and get painting and drawing classes. This is our living room gallery. Um, we titled it, we're calling it The Living Room because we're trying to make sure that we're using language that reinforces this idea that this museum is meant to be a space for the people that it serves. It's meant to feel like home. It should be special, of course, and it is special, but it should feel like the kids that come in and their families and their friends really own it 
And so this is our living room. And this is a six-wall mural painted by the artist Saya Wolfolk. Um, and it was inspired right over here. Is it break in the middle? This drawing here was a sketch that her four-year-old daughter Aya drew. And Saya came in and took that drawing and literally started on that wall and then blew up to all the other walls. We really didn't have much of an idea of what it was, the finished product was going to look like. And we were really lucky because that's a beautiful story. <laughs> and we have, you know, our preschool is our, our major partner specifically in our inaugural year, so they're three and four, so that's really great, talking about efficacy. Um, but also, this entire mural was painted over a two-week period in partnership with an organization called Creative Youth Think, and they have, um, they service teenagers, so we worked with about 20 17 and 18 year olds that painted this mural in collaboration with Zaya and two other artists and teaching artists, Taj Ras and Alexander Casso. And here we see some kids engaging with the work. So we, this is a beautiful mural. It, it really speaks to a children's museum. It's contemporary art, but it also is open enough and bright enough where kids can really tell stories, and that's what we do. We try really hard to not tell them anything that we think, <laughs> but really just hear from them all of their ideas. And so they're exploring this gallery um, with their finished pieces actually after the fact to reconsider what they made. Um, these are, we're calling these story stones. And so we're constantly, whenever you come to the Children's Museum, you'll come to our studio labs and you'll see, after you've explored the galleries, and you'll see that we've got all of these different areas set up meant to encourage free exploration without facilitation. Our facilitation is largely in curating what we put in the space, in the making space, and making it relevant to the work that's on view. And encouraging storytelling because we believe that giving space for young people to hear their voices and to celebrate their ideas is fundamentally important. So these are story stones and an amazing intern, Nina Birch from Bank Street, photographed our mural, cut them up and modge podge them onto these stones. And so they live in our studio labs and the young people that visit and their families can just move them around and embody these characters and tell these stories. Um, here's our preschoolers, and this is our salon gallery. This is our exhibition text, Art, Language, and Design, and they are investigating this piece here, Tech City, by artist Hong Jung Sing. And um, this residency with these guys, they come once a week, and I have the privilege of teaching them along with Jeanette Rodriguez Pineda, who's the other teaching artist with these kids. And, um, we're thinking about structures. And so we visited this gallery, and they're drawing from observation. And these are old letter presses. So they're able to see and identify all the letters and numbers. And it's amazing how much time we can spend with four-year-olds just seeing how many backwards S's we can find. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun for us. Um, but yeah, we're, we're sitting down drawing from observation. And we're also introducing perspective to them. So these guys, they enter, they enter into our building, into their building. They're adopting hats as architects. They understand architecture. We're talking about structure, and we're also talking about perspective. And these are three- and four-year-olds, right? I should say that the Salon Gallery is a partnership with El Museo del Barrio. And this is our legacy gallery, and this is a partnership with the Studio Museum. They were generous enough to, get, to lend us several pieces from their archives. Um, and all of these works are celebrating Harlem in some way, either artists from Harlem or thinking about the life of Harlem or the culture of Harlem. And when we talk about young people seeing themselves in the work, I think that this gallery really embodies that. And here they are, again, because we're looking at structure, they are gathered around Sassy Shack by Beverly Buchanan, um, a very different structural piece than Tech City that we looked at before. So considering use of materials, and that's really important because we give them materials and then we ask them to figure it out. So <laughs> we needed to kind of preface it with different ways that artists address this. And so what we're looking at here are um, our kids working together. We didn't give them any glue or tape, which was insanely frustrating to their teachers. Um, <laughs> 
but working together to create structures for the characters on the walls of our living room gallery. Um, and we came to that because there are no structures on those walls, right? So really thinking about how are we engaging young people with the art that's on view beyond explaining it, beyond asking them to explain it, but to really interact with it. And so that's why we wanted to have them contribute something specific to the work. Um, and you can see, <laughs> here they are working together, and then they got to work by themselves, and she's really trying to figure out how to figure out how to work with these pieces. <laughs> and then over here, um, this is one group's solution. They were challenged to make it stand, and they just really didn't care that I said that. And here's another one. And this group kind of fascinated me because without any prompting at all, they gave their city a border. And these both have very different but very real stories to them. Here, this is a path, and you are meant to start here and walk this way and go across the bridge to this other building that's over here. And they walked us through that. And over here, this is about Here's their bridge to their outer world, but this is about having their community be safe. Um, you know, so when we have these moments happen, really listening to that and having that guide what we do next is important to us. I was told to be patient, but... <laughs> I'll try one more time. Maybe next slide. Ah. So um, this is stage two of that same project. So here they are. These kids are designing their blueprints for the buildings, for the structures that they're going to make. And they knew the word blueprint already. I thought that was going to be a big thing for us to teach them. But they knew it because they had been covering architecture in their preschool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't have to do anything. So, oh, wait, let me go back. So they used those blueprints, and then they came into the studio labs, and they were given we don't hand them materials for this project. We just lay them out, and they get to go shopping for their materials. And that's important, too, because we're trying to not be prescriptive. So we give a wealth of materials that are interesting to us, that are sustainable, because it's also important that we are providing opportunities that can be replicated at home, and that parents don't feel like they need to, be, to go out and buy expensive materials to create art with their young people. Um, so. Here they are using their blueprint drawings to create their structures. And you can just see the focus. You know, you don't see any adult standing in this space. And the whole, I'm, I'm using these images and I'm speaking in this way because the purpose is for us to really consider and continue to consider and continue to consider how are we giving agency or how are we providing space for agency for young people. And it's not about the educator. We have to step back and let it happen, and again, learn from what they're doing. I um, mean, here they're finishing up their, um, they finished their drawing, their structures, and they are using watercolor pencils to draw them, and then turn those into paintings. And all of this will be part of an end of the year exhibition, which we all do, right? These guys are our three-year-olds, and um, we needed to segue into clay really quickly because they, were not really responding to the idea of structures for the characters on the walls in a living room. And there was a lot of crying and a lot of wanting to be first in line and just not feeling it, you know? So Jeanette and I stood back and we're like, okay, well, what should we do? Because these kids are not digging this project at all. And so we're like, Clay. So, um, so this is just an image of them working with clay. It worked. They like it a lot. <laughs> and, um, and we decided what we wanted them. I've had this thing about our patio and wanting to draw attention to the patio. And so here you see letters and numbers that they made. And these are the finished pieces on the plates. And they've painted them. And we're going to be gluing them together and making alphabet structures that will live here in our patio gardens that Ellen lovingly cultivates, um, which 
is just another way. Literally, they're changing the landscape of the building with their artwork, and they're literally going to be affecting the way that people experience entering into their space, which I think will be really nice for them. They're excited. They know. <laughs> um, so we're thinking about engagement on a lot of different levels and bringing in we think about the intersection of art and, every, and everyday life and art and just living. And we can't just serve the children. We need to serve their families. And so in deep partnership with our preschool director and her teachers and our artists in residence, who you can see over here. This is David Schrope. He's our artist in residence this year. He's an assemblage artist. He is from Harlem. And he'll tell you that he wanders the streets of Harlem picking up different things that catch his eye and they inform his work. And he's got these really beautiful pieces in his studio. Um, and so we took that practice. We sourced all of these materials, the preschool teachers and directors sourced all of these materials and brought them in and we had um, a family workshop. There are about 100 families here on this day which was great. And here is just an image inside of our studio labs of them making, and this is a finished piece. We also are lucky enough to have really generous artists working with us that are part of our exhibitions. And this um, is another family workshop uh, in partnership with artists in our artist Antonia Perez, who is on view in our salon gallery. And so she works a lot with weavings and sustainable materials. And so we did weaving for this Saturday afternoon, which is a lot more prescriptive than we generally go. But it's also, I think, important to have a balance. And so we wanted her to bring her practice to our families and have them engage in that way with her. And so she did. And up top here is the finished piece. And this is Antonia. We love her. And this is her work here that is on view in our salon gallery. And this is a welcome mat woven from um, plastic bags. And it says, Estas en tu casa. And that message carries many layers of meaning. It's literal translation is, you're in your house. you know. But again, we want people to feel like they're home and that when they come to us, it's their space. And then also thinking about sustainability on a global level and the way that we use materials and being responsible artists and educators. And this is our family workshop where there is no artist, but they're really engaging with the work. So we put out this blank piece of paper in front of our stage, in front of size, a signature piece in the center of our stage. And then parents and children came and they worked here. And these are largely three-year-olds on the right and their parents and families. And um, they were meant to do two activities that day, switch 45 minutes and 45 minutes. We usually think, oh, preschool, 45 minutes. Um, but they stayed there for an hour and a half cutting this paper in total silence. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> so I left them. OK, you know, let them tell me what to do. That's fine. And here are some details. Maybe next slide. OK. Um, we also do school tours, like I'm sure the majority of people in this room. And we offer a variety of different tours to our young students that visit us. But again, kind of just trying to um, provide the space for young people to do whatever they want, <laughs> really. And so this workshop is called Imagination to Actualization. And they are led through all three galleries and then brought into the studio labs and asked to close their eyes and vision a memory from their walk through the galleries. And then use the work that's on the tables, use the materials that are on the tables laid out to create their works. And so each child leaves with their own piece. And of course, practice. We, um, in the reflection at the end of the session, they're all able to tell their stories, or you know, four or five of them are able to, to explain their work. And I wanted to just show this one on the right behind Steve because I thought that was incredibly sophisticated for a four-year-old to, <laughs> to select and cut these shapes and outline them with just a white Kanta crayon, um, as opposed to what's typically happening, which are reaching for all of these amazing materials and putting them on the page. You know, so I just wanted to share that with you guys.
And here they are leaving. And here's another example, vastly different from the other one, and from the same class. And, and that's just kind of the point, you know, is, is re how many opportunities we have for each individual to express themselves and for there not to be an expected result, you know? It's like what happens when we don't tell young people what we expect from them, but we have our expectations set up here. This is, we're a storytelling museum, so <laughs> our first camp was centered and grounded in um, literally creating books. So each child created a book, and they were able to create a book whatever they wanted, about whatever they wanted, using a variety of different materials as long as we had these elements in it. And so they were taught story, character, setting, plot, and the final book. And here's just some of the process. This is one of our teaching artists here, Taj Rust. Um, we've got a blank storyboard up here on our chalkboard wall that's painted on the walls of our studio labs. And in there, on any given day, you can walk in and it should say, make your mark on top. And it's one of the other ways that we're asking for anonymous feedback. And we look at it and we're seeing, like, is there any, what, are, what are the tidbits that are here today? But here we're looking at a collective storyboarding. So they, were, they, they drew and collaged onto the wall and then collectively told that story before going into their own. This is a detail that a child is working on. It says, one upon a time, but they need to think for another song. <laughs> so he's creating a new song in his book. Maybe next slide? All right. And this is the end of camp. So Audrey and Tyrell are shown in these two images here, but what we did was our celebration was each child sharing with all of their peers their book stories that they created. So saying them out loud and presenting them. And here are two other of our campers. Another way and the final thing that I'll talk about in this series of slides um, is we've been holding storytelling auditions. So if you know of storytellers, let them know that we are continuously holding auditions. Um, but we've held four sessions, and in each session, children are, we ask storytellers to create something where the children are leading the story in some way. And then, so you'll see some hands are raised here, and this man, you can see he's got a prosthetic leg, and his story was about compassion and diversity and in that way. And so he's asking people if they know anybody that has a different body or, or is different in some way, and so they're answering. And then we ask them what they thought of their story. And these are the evaluations. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't want to, um, there wasn't enough room to, to put many, many of them, but they really do, they're not all smiles. And they really are like, I didn't like this person, Miss Jen. And you know, I asked them why or whatever, but this one's my favorite. This, I don't care about this program. <laughs> it's, like, it's not even good enough to be bad. It's just <laughs> flat. <laughs> so our curator, Lauren Kelly, uh, created these. And I thought they were just brilliant. And because they, they're understood, you know, it's, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can, you can color in whatever smiley face you feel about the person that you just saw. So those are some of the ways that we ask people to tell us what they think, and it guides the way that we do the work that we do. Um, and just, I also, we run a program that we call Rounds on the second Tuesday of every month, and we've adopted it from Steve. And um, it's basically a forum where we come together as people that care about the arts. Either we identify as educators or we don't. We identify as artists as we don't or we don't. But we believe in the importance and the possibility of it. And that happens the second Tuesday of every month. And I, from 5 to 7.30, and I give good food. And I invite you to come and join us. Great. Great. So, Jen, when you were um, talking about uh, the, the study of architecture in preschool, um, it reminded me of a conversation I had a number of years ago with an architect who described 
his uh, formal studies and design school as kindergarten with power tools. <laughs> so um, seems like it's appropriate that yeah. people are studying how to build and make things. Um, we wanted to just uh, try to take up one other intersection um, a little more explicitly before we, before we wrap up here. And that um, is, sort of, is the intersection of this work that you see so beautifully um, represented and described here, and the urgency, the, the daily urgency of social justice work in um, this neighborhood, this city, this society, this world. And, um, and we th thought that we would um, sort of close our remarks this morning with um, brief comments from each of us about that. And am I going first? I cannot. You go first. I think, okay. <laughs> um, often uh, in conversation about social justice, uh, work and the urgency of that work, uh, I don't hear that much discussion, explicit discussion of the significance um, and urgency of that for very young children. And I've been pushed by my colleagues in the preschools in Reggio Emilia to um, ask myself the question, when do I think that a human being becomes a citizen? At what point do we have the role of citizen as part of our identity? And they have certainly encouraged me to think about that as um, part of one's identity from the first breath of life. And one of the things that I hear so strongly in Faith's work and I see so strongly in these images and what Jen has been sharing, and, in the, and in, indeed in the uh, dream of this museum, was a deep, deep conviction that very young children have um, not only rights, but the capacity to contribute to their community, to their school, their institutions, um, their schools, their museums, um, and to the society. And that the denial of that right to contribute is a diminishing that is internalized. This to me is um, tragic and wrong, but especially tragic and wrong in relation to the growing, developing, emerging consciousness and identity of young children of color in this society, in this brutal society. So any effort that we make to create, to transform existing institutions or create new institutions that give children a central role as creators and contributors seems to me to be radical work in this society. I approached this work with a background of 10 years teaching in public schools for what we label collectively too many times as under these underserved areas, you know, and um, the reason for that was not because I was an artist looking to pay my con ed bill. The reason for that was because I always have had and held a fundamental belief in the possibility of the arts as a tool for social transformation. And as people that work in, that run, that contribute to, participate, visit, utilize cultural institutions, we need to be aware of the power that we hold. When, we, when there's something that's placed on the wall in these buildings, somebody said that that work is important. And when we introduce that work to people, when we, and we engage that with them, we want to be mindful of the degree to which they are able to see themselves reflected, whoever that may be, whoever you're interested in serving, whatever the cause is. 
You know, there are societal structures that are built and are oppressive, and we are taught to operate within them. So when, we're, when we have the gift to be able to create space for young people's voices to not only be celebrated, but to be validated and to, in fact, direct the way that the adults are moving, I think that we begin to provide room for that, those structures to be um, dissolved a little bit. Great. So um, thank you. Seven minutes before Emma. So um, we're being told that we have a five, about five minutes, and uh, we felt we'd open it and invite, uh, certainly happy to invite questions, but we're also really happy to invite thought. It's also nice to take time to think. Hi, my name is uh, Bill Elliston. I'm at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, I am really impressed with uh, the work that you guys are doing, um, and thank you so much for, for coming to NICMAR to do this. Um, I would love to hear any thoughts that you guys have um, on how to incorporate some of these thoughts on like boundary pushing and boundary dissolving um, that you guys have been working in the arts. Uh, and how can that be applied to some of the sciences that, uh, that people are focusing on? Thank you for the question. I, I didn't understand it. I'm sorry. Okay. So he asked, um, you guys spoke a lot about the intersection of the arts yeah. uh, and social justice. How do you, do you have thoughts on how to incorporate that into sciences? So science museums or zoos? Oh. Um. I think, I mean, my answer is always, you know, that your intention, our intentions are what, what matter and what guide us, and the way that we ask questions and the way that we invite self-discovery, I think, is, is my answer. You know, I don't know, but I, my, my practice is in trying to not not necessarily have the answer or give the answer, but to create as much space as possible for people to find their own. Because I think disrupting some of the, the social justice issues that we think about are really about having people that are able to embody their own power and know that, you know. Would it be okay if we um, talked about technology and engineering and um, yeah. as well? So this, this, the larger STEM picture, um, which I've been struggling with what does STEM actually mean and encompass. Um, but uh, one, one of the, uh, another uh, unnatural and inappropriate and unfortunate uh, bifurcation that we've uh, bought into in these times and in the society is the separateness of art and science, art and technology, art and engineering and mathematics. And um, of course, they're, they're not separate. They are different. They have distinctive qualities, each of these realms of activity, and the distinctions are interesting and important, but they're um, they don't, none of them survive alone. So it, one of the things that's interesting to me is to try to think about transdisciplinary uh, capacities like imagination. So imagination is, um, you know, some, some folks in the arts would claim that this is, this is our thing. Um, but say that to a scientist or a mathematician, and they will know that you're full of shit. 
<laughs> um, what's interesting is to actually engage in conversation with folks working in those areas and um, try to say, so how do you use your imagination? What does it do for you? How does it get, when, when, how? How do you cultivate it? How do you exercise it? Um, when does it save you? When does it mess you up? All, I mean, there's just endless important questions that we could be engaged with. And, how do, and to go back and forth around that, I think in particular, um, people working in technology and in engineering are trying to imagine um, the world differently. And there's a tr there, and they have great power. Um, that power can be used uh, for good and for ill. And the whole issue of the environment and um, the environmental consequences of our technological and engineering choices um, is just one of the realms in which we see the in tremendous need for um, social consciousness and moral imagination in, um, uh, in those who do, who design the world. And um, I always think that there's a, a tremendous room for us to be engaged, artists and um, engineers, designers of all sorts, um, in a conversation about what the world should really be like. I have a feeling that I didn't actually address your question at all. But I was, but I was so relieved to have some thought in response to it. That I, I just shared it. I apologize if I didn't. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Steven, for Thank you. you.